Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 19. This morning we will be studying and examining verses 27 to 30. In these few verses that we have before us, they teach us a very important spiritual lesson. And they contain something that our Lord obviously wanted us to know and that the Holy Spirit graciously preserved in the Scripture for our edification. And it's that we can safely suffer loss in obedience to the call of Jesus because he promises us that we will gain back whatever we forsake for his name. No one who ever gives up all to follow Jesus ends up a loser. Okay? I, I have known some men in my life that they have given up wealth, they have given up positions in companies, and even their own companies, left those because the Lord Jesus has called them into the ministry and to serve him. I think of a friend of mine who went at the same school that I did several years before me. He uh, went on to go to uh, down in Rolla at the university there, became a great engineer, went down to Texas. He was always a church member, he said, but he got down to Texas and uh, got involved in church, and he said, I truly became a Christian. And uh, he worked for a company down there, and he had his own private pilot and co-pilot. He had his own private leisure jet. He was working in making a yearly salary of way over a six-figure digit. And he said in the middle of a Sunday night service, he said he, he, he just fell, of course, he fell in love and love more with the Lord and with the Lord's word. And he said that it was in a Sunday night service that he just knew that God was calling him to teach his word, to, to volunteer to teach in a Sunday school class. And he said he did that, and he just started loving the Lord more and more and the word of the Lord more and more. And he said he just couldn't stop reading and studying the scriptures. Now, this guy has a degree in engineering, okay? And he told his pastor about it, and his pastor wisely said, well, let's continue to pray about this, and I'll pray for you and with you. And they did, and he finally went to Paul and said, hey, I'm going to ask you if you'll do me a favor. He said, our little second church over here needs a fill-in because that guy's going to go on vacation. He said, would you do it? And Paul was like, oh, I can't do it. And he said, oh, just do your Bible study that you do. So he did. And when the guy came back, the guy went away on a, to, uh, for a call at another church. And when he announced he was leaving, they just asked Paul to stay as their pastor. And he gave up that six-figure digit. And a lot of people in the corporate world and some of his own family and some of the people in the church thought that Paul had just lost his mind. But Paul knew that the Lord had called him to that little bitty church. And uh, he went there and he stayed there for about four years. And then he and his wife felt the call of the Lord to go to New York. And they sold their home and everything and they moved to New York with their two kids and they now minister in some of the roughest areas of the city of New York that most intelligent people wouldn't even go to. But Paul is down there, and he is preaching and teaching the Word of God. And he told me one day, he said, I know a lot of people feel that I have lost my mind and that I gave up everything that was worth anything. He said, but you know, Brother Bruce, he said, I did it for the Lord because the Lord called me that. He said, and I'm more blessed than I've ever been. So there are no followers of Jesus who give up everything who are losers. You're winners. Now, this morning, let's look closely at our passage and notice something that is honestly telling us. First of all is this. There are losses that come when Jesus calls. All right? When Jesus calls a person to serve in the ministry of Jesus Christ there can be and there will be losses to that cause. And there's no false advertising here. 
He says yes to, when, when someone says yes to the call of Jesus, that may mean that no, there you are not going to experience comforts and security that this world has to offer. And it was the same for Peter, James, and John and all the others. Those guys were able to say, behold, we have left everything and followed you. And notice that the Lord, in this case, he does not correct them. He does not rebuke them for having made that claim. And let's think of these men. In case of Peter and his brother Andrew, it meant living, leaving their fishing business. They had a fishing business. It was their livelihood. And Jesus said, come follow me. And they just said, okay. And then in the case of James and John, their sacrifice was even more difficult. Because not only did they leave their fishing business, because as you know, they were partners with Peter and Andrew, but they also left family ties behind. Matthew tells us in chapter 4, verses 21 to 22, that they left their dad, who? Zebedee. And beloved, if you read that text in Matthew 4, we don't get any sense that, that they wrongfully abandoned their father Zebedee. And Zebedee, in its present tense there, has no objection to them or their leaving. When James and John left the family business, old dad didn't say, Whoa, boys, wait. What about me? What about mom? What about the business? We don't read any of that. There was no question that they had to make a tough decision now to leave their father behind. Along with the trade their father had taught them and perhaps even a family business that took many years to build in order to answer Jesus' call. Think of the writer of the gospel that we're studying today, Matthew. Matthew himself, the man whom Jesus used to record these words that we're reading this morning, he was a tax collector, a man who took taxes from his kinsmen on behalf of the Roman government. Yet we read that Jesus saw him sitting at the tax office as he walked by and told Matthew two words, follow me. And it was up to the one of the other gospel writers to point out the humility of old Matthew. Matthew didn't even write it himself. One of the other writers did. Matter of fact, it was Dr. Luke. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 28, he said that Matthew left all, rose up, and followed him. Matthew didn't ask any questions about a retirement program, vacation time, health benefits. Jesus said, follow me. And Luke says, he left all, rose up, and followed him. In verse 29, Jesus indicates that his call to service may require that some very precious things be left behind. He suggests that some would have to leave houses, the place that not only represented security and provision for the future, but that also provided comfort and safety and rest for right then and there. Jesus himself felt this way because you remember what he said over in Matthew 8, verse 20. He said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus goes on to say that some would have to leave brothers and sisters. Now, our Lord certainly understood that one, didn't he? Because the Bible tells us in John chapter 7 and verse 5, even his brothers did not believe him. They did not believe that he was the Messiah. Others would have to leave fathers and mothers behind. Now many, not only in the scriptures, but many today can testify the feeling that the Lord Jesus Christ had put them at odds, sometimes irreversible, with their own closest family members. I have to stand before you and testify that that happened to me. When I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, I had family members that they just turned their backs on me and for years would not even speak to me. 
And some of you have experienced that too. He goes on in some countries and cultures, it involved being that the, that the family member who accepted Jesus Christ, who accepted the call of Jesus Christ, was set outside of their families forever. In some cultures, if you accept Christ as Lord and Savior, that family will literally have a funeral for you. Because to them, you are dead. You are no longer alive, and your name is not spoken in the family circles. Some would have to leave the comforts of their own immediate, immediate family circles, and some would have to leave children behind. The gospel according to Luke, verse 18 and 29, Luke, the physician, he writes, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now, I don't believe that the Lord ever called a man to abandon his rightful responsibility to his wife and children, okay? No, don't, let's not go there. I have seen some men try to use that as an excuse. And I, my, my own personal feeling is I feel sorry for you. You are taking the word of God, twisting it to your favor to do a disobedience. But rather, I believe that this would almost likely mean that a man may be called to serve the Lord rather than to marry and start a family. And you've known men and women like that. I've known men and women like that who have left the possibility of, of getting married and having children, and they've gone to be missionaries or pastors in faraway places where they feel that they can serve the Lord there better single. And praise God for those people. As Jesus said back in Verse 12 of chapter 19, there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Paul even said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and you see it in your outline there, Paul even encouraged those who could do so to stay single and give themselves totally uninterrupted to the Lord's service. It is also sadly possible that becoming a follower of Jesus Christ may put a wedge between a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse. As a new believer's faith in Christ may be so deeply resented by the unbelieving partner that they depart from the believing one. That's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. And a follower of Jesus must be prepared to pay even that price. Amen? It may happen. Unfortunately, it may happen, beloved. What Jesus is saying here in our text, some would have to leave the lands behind. Now, thinking of that, leaving your lands behind, that would be an unthinkable thing in Jewish culture. Okay? Your land was your earthly inheritance of each Jewish tribe. And of each Jewish family within that tribe. This is your parcel of land. The tribe of Benjamin. This is where you live. And each family within the tribe of Benjamin or whatever the tribe was, you lived within here and you did not go out of it. You stayed right there. And to leave the land behind would be to leave behind a, a connectedness with one's earthly past and one's own earthly future. So it truly does cost to follow Jesus, doesn't it? Some of you have experienced that in your own lives. It's the most expensive adventure a person could ever sign up for. But it's also one of the greatest re rewarding ones. It definitely involves a loss of many of the comforts and pleasures of the world. So when Peter made that statement, behold, we have left everything and followed you, it was a fair question. It was a very qu fair question. And then he says this, he says, what then will there be for us? And it's a question that Jesus graciously answers. Matthew writes that he said to them, 
Now, in the original language of the Bible, Christ speaks in the plural, okay? To them all. He didn't just say, well, Peter, or well, Andrew, James, or John. He said, to all of you. To all of them. All of who? All of the disciples. All of the disciples who were right then and there. And we're going to see that in a few moments. But all of the future disciples. Okay? And I believe Christ's answer not only, was not only for their sake, but it was for ours as well. And this brings us to the second point. When we leave everything for his calling, okay, he promises to restore many times as much to those who follow him. The one thing we should notice is Jesus' answers is solemn. He says to them, truly I say to you. Now, I've said to you before, and I'll say it to you again, whenever the scripture says, and it starts out, and Jesus says, truly I say to you, or truly, truly, what he's saying is, hey, I want to get your attention, because what I'm going to tell you is of the utmost importance. So listen to me, guys. Listen to me, people. That's what he's saying. Okay? And that phrase from the, our Savior's lips should never be taken lightly. All that our Lord and Master says is true. Amen? But here he calls our attention in a very forceful way to the truth of what he is about to say to them. It is a once for all time answer to the important question. And it's one that you and I can trust as well. We see that each part of Jesus' answer is spoken directly, or the first part is spoken directly to the twelve, isn't it? Look at verse 28 of our text, Matthew 19. And Jesus said to them, who's the them? Again, it's the disciples. It's the followers that are right there standing or sitting before him. He says, truly I say to you that you have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you, now he's talking to the twelve, you also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay? That's what he's telling the twelve disciples, or soon to be the twelve apostles. But now let me ask you a question. What about you and I? What about you and I who have believed their message, believed in the gospel, believed in Jesus Christ, and have gone on to follow Jesus as well? Well, Jesus has a promise for us as well. Okay? Because look at verse 29. Uh, 29. He says, and, there's that connecting verse. Verse 28 is to the 12. And everyone. Who's Everyone. Everyone. Everyone is everyone. Everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or farms, for my sakes, my name's sake, will receive many times as much. Okay? But look, there's another and in there. And will inherit eternal life. Christ's promise is a broad one, and it applies to everyone who has left the comforts and security of this life to follow his call. When we read how this promise is recorded in other Gospels, we see that it comes in two parts, really. Number one part applies, as Mark has it, in this time, he says. That's Mark 10.30. Or as Luke has it in his, in, in Luke 18, 29, in the present time. Right now. At this time, as we live for Jesus on this earth, he promises that we shall receive a hundredfold of that which we have left for his name's sake. 
I got to thinking about that statement, and not only the disciples, but after disciples, okay, on down the line. And I think of uh, John Wesley. John Wesley was a man who sacrificed so much for the cause of the gospel. But in his own personal diary, in his own personal testimony, he says that he never once in all his long life felt really sacrificed, that he really sacrificed anything for the Lord. He said, because the Lord gave it all back to me a hundredfold. Now, please listen to this, okay? Whatever it may cost you or me in this time, right now, to follow Jesus, we have his promise that, he, that we will receive from his hand multiple times over. All right? Whatever it is that we've forsaken for his call. The, the next part, or number two, part of the promise applies to us, as Mark has it, in the age to come. That's Mark 10.30 as well. The Lord says in our text in Matthew 19, He says, we will inherit eternal life. That's verse 29. Beloved, the greatest reason to follow Jesus Christ in His call on your life is because He is the pathway to eternal life. Okay? There's no other way to Jesus. And we gain back everything in life that we gave up in order to follow Jesus faithfully. And when it's over and done, we gain eternal life. We give up for Jesus what we cannot keep in order to gain with him what we cannot lose. I'm going to make this statement, and I'm not making it flippantly or disrespectfully, but following Jesus Christ is the greatest deal in the universe. You follow Jesus Christ, you are a winner now, here in the present time, and you are a winner in future time. Where's the loss in that? There is none. But you don't follow Jesus now, you're going to be a loser. And in the eternal time, you're definitely going to be a loser. And you've lost everything. Now, before we come to a close here this morning, I believe it's important to stress that this isn't a promise for just anyone who gives up everything. Okay? There are many people out there today that, that they leave the comforts of this life in order to pursue, I'll put it, a self-imposed pseudo-spiritual life. Okay? They think, well, if I give up this, 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 and this, and the comforts of this and this, I'll be even that much greater and that much holier of a Christian. But I'll give it all up. Now, if God is calling you to give it up, beloved, give it up. Okay? But if he hasn't, don't give it up just to try to be holy. That lifestyle accomplishes absolutely nothing. I believe there are some people that God has said, give up comforts of this world. And I've known them. And they give it up. And they're fully blessed and, and, and happy and content of the Lord. But I know some that have done it just to draw attention to themselves. And God gets no reward. That behavior is nothing more than, than a presumption, and it gains no favor with the Lord God. Jesus makes it very clear that we are not to lay aside the things of life on our own initiative for our own sake, thinking, well, if I give up Fruit Loops, I'll be considered holy. Or if I give up whatever, you know, if I give up the red vehicle for the all-black vehicle with the black bumper and the black rims and the black hubcaps, then I'm going to be super holy. But I'm still driving that black car. See, that's, that's, no. Now, if God calls you to do that, then do it. 
Okay? Then do it. But he makes it very clear not to lay it aside on your own. Rather, we are to do so in response to his call, just like Peter, James, and John, and Matthew, and the rest of them. Jesus looked at those men, and he said, Come, follow me. And they just kind of went, bloom, and they left, and they followed him. They left everything behind when Christ Jesus called them. And God goes before us, in a sense, beckoning us, as it were, if we follow him, where he leads, he'll provide. In verse 29, Jesus applies this promise only to those who leave the comfort of this life for my sake, he says. Or as it says in Mark, Mark's account, for my sake in the Gospels. Or Dr. Luke, Luke puts it, for the sake of the kingdom of God. Well, let's close with this. The main point is this, when he calls us to follow, and when that call to follow involves leaving behind comforts and security of the things of this earth, we can safely let those things go. We can safely let them go. We can confidently suffer loss of all things as the call of Jesus because he promises that we will gain many times over whatever it is that we forsake for him and his cause. So let me ask you something this morning. Is he calling you in some way this morning? If he is... Let me just say this with all the confidence in the world. Trust him. Trust him. As I said earlier, no one who gives their all for him, Jesus Christ, will ever end up a loser. You are a winner. You are a winner. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we ask that you would enable us to hear and to respond in our hearts to this, the truth of your word in Matthew 19. Father, help us to be obedient to it. And when you call us, Father, help us to be willing and obedient disciples and follow you. For Christ's sake we pray, amen and amen.